In matters of conscience, the law of majority has no place. Written by Mahatma Gandhi. Good evening, everyone. And this afternoon's show is a continuation, as you know, of our last show, where we really could not embrace the whole theme of sin and relativism. Um, so we decided to split our show, and today we will talk about relativism and conscience, because we have so much to talk about, hence the quotation at the beginning. And both Natasha and I thought using this quotation from Mahatma Gandhi was apt, as it really helps embrace the theme and what we're going to speak about today in terms of conscience. And there's literally, when we speak about conscience, there is right and wrong conscience coming from the word. And I know our um, priest on set will actually go into it more, but with knowledge. So we're going to look at it from that perspective. Now, for our viewers, just to remind you, because I know we've been on a month already, um, what we did, we spoke about sin, and we spoke about spiritual, the spiritual health, that is our spiritual health, which is affected by sin, literally like a disease that really encroaches or encroaches on our soul. And we related that to relativism and conscience. And in tonight's show, we're going to speak more about relativism and conscience, really how that ties into the priority, the third priority being regenerating moral and spiritual values. And that priority really teaches us, or what, what the church wants to teach us as a community, is really to embrace God's word in our, how we carry about our everyday duties and really bring again God to the center of our lives and the center of our community and therefore improve our life and improve our society at the end of the day. We are going to look in, in detail about relativism, moving us or speaking about it in terms of the, us have being the center and removing God from the center of our lives. And we're going to speak about conscience in terms of making that conscious decision as to what to do and what is right and what is wrong. So we have a very, we have a great show in store for you all today, tonight. And um, before I go on any further, I'm going to introduce Natasha. Good evening, Natasha. Thanks, Lorraine, and good evening to all our viewers. I'm happy to be here again. This was, as I had shared with you all the last time, a little difficult topic for me. It caused me to, cause both of us to go yes. back <laughs> and really research it, you know, because um, we live in a society now in which um, there's a lot of subjectivism, and I think C.S. Lewis had a, um, an article, uh, an essay, that about the poison of subjectivism, and that is that's a lot of big words. We said that last time Correct. too, you know. But basically, it is um, conscience, and you're imposing your own will on conscience rather than forming your conscience, causing your church and other things to form your conscience, you know. Um, so tonight, Lorraine told you what the theme is, and we're going to have our on-the-road clips where we go and we speak to people on the road, um, asking them, because you hear from Lorraine and I, you'll hear from our priest, from a Catholic perspective, our Catholic teaching, you will call in, right? Um, and we go on the road. So we speak to three ladies about what they think conscience is, and we have our two families from last um, show as well, the Coopers and the Gonzales, and they help us about the theme relativism. You know, both of them are inextricably linked. You can't take one out from the other. Because um, what is your conscience? What is conscionable to me may not be conscionable to, to Lorraine, although we're both Catholics, formed probably from the same thing, you know, good Catholic school, whatever, whatever. Um, yet still, when faced with a, a moral dilemma, um, is there a subjective law that applies or is there an objective moral law? And how does our own inner voice, our conscience, um, impose upon that to help us make a decision? Is a lot. It's a lot. But you see, um, we have to be grappling with harder things now. You know, gone are the days where we just go to church, sit on comatose, listen to Father, <laughs> um, sing if you feel, don't sing if you feel, because I find congregations yes. not even singing anymore, yes. right? And go home. And you feel tick. I've done that. I've done the church thing. And now you're 
I hope Go it is. Rest of your week, yes. and then you come back and you repeat it again. We have to get deeper. We have to start to say bigger words like relativism, conscience, subjectivism, natural law. Yes, natural law. You know, moral law. We have to get deeper. All right, and it's not a call for some to get deeper. It's a call for all of us to get deeper. Correct. So we are not experts in this at all, <laughs> right? It's not totally, we have to click on the internet, search, 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 Google, Chrome, everybody, right? But um, we're just here to tease it out with you. So um, without further ado, um, we're going to start with our woman on the street, our man on the street, and um, they're going to answer for us what, how relative is conscience, okay? So let's go to our first person. I think that conscience is an internal mechanism that directs moral thinking and it is what allows us to think, speak and to act in ways that are pleasing to God. Now it's there from birth I believe but through training and formation it's developed. So this is why in some instances you will have people who would be making wrong decisions because they just did not have that formation that allowed the conscience to grow and develop. So it's something that has to be nurtured, but I also believe it's innate and its purpose really is to help us to do those things that God would want us to do. So we want to thank um our woman on the street <laughs> for that very succinct um, definition of her belief of what conscience is and what she said was so accurate uh, and uh, according to Natasha you know we have to get into these big words and it's not about going to church every Sunday anymore it's about a way of life it's about formation and that's what she spoke to and now I want to go and introduce you to our next person our next young lady who we spoke to again asking her what is conscience and her perspective on conscience I think the family is one of the first points of someone starting to form their conscience. So for me, growing up, I would look at the way that my family, like my grandmother, my mom, my uncles and aunts and cousins, the way that they would interact people with, with people and uh, the morals and the, their values. And I would, I've sort of taken what I saw growing up and applied it to my own life. And that's helped me start forming my making my decisions when it comes down to a choice that is difficult. So seeing what I have experienced as a child and growing up, of course. Um, and also, I think the church is one of the, also a very important um, source of guidance in forming your conscience. So the teachings of the church and seeing priests and lay people and consecrated people um, Seeing their example um, and the way that they live their lives, uh, the, the decisions that they make um, has helped me in, in forming my conscience. You see, we're talking about formation of conscience and now we're going into development of conscience. That young lady talked about her granny and her mom and her bringing her family. Those things form conscience, even from the womb, I dare say, because we are the embodiment of God from the womb and open to so many things, as research says. So conscience has been formed even from that, what you're aware of, what you're, you've been exposed to. And then you see that formation of conscience, I think that's just my, my, my take on it, goes into how you develop that conscience now. When you become aware, when they say you get to the age of reason at seven, when you know the difference between right and wrong, and you have to make choices. She alluded to that as well, you know. How do we make decisions when faced with choices? That now goes into the realm of development of conscience. How developed is your conscience? So certain things form your conscience, right? And then you develop it by your choices, by actual life situations. So we have one more person we stopped on the street <laughs> and um, asking them about the development of conscience. So let's go to that person. I can just from knowing what is right from wrong through my parents, their strictness. Um, when I was bad, I was punished, I was grounded and so forth. Um, society, 
helped me in a way because certain things you would know what is right from wrong when you look at certain things like everyday life and so forth um, and then after a while I guess you, you start to, to see for yourself and you start to understand for yourself exactly what is right from wrong and you develop that kind of moral within yourself to say well what you deemed right what you deem wrong so I guess that's it yeah and she puts it so nicely, you know, in terms of developing consciousness. She said she learned from her parents, she learns from society. And we all, we all have teachings from various parts in life. And um, that's what's important, our environment and how it's formed. And after it's formed, how we go on to develop it. She says, you know, she looks sometimes to society and decides, um, what well, is this right or wrong? Because she's already had that formation from her home from her parents and now she's about to make a decision but as we spoke about in the beginning very difficult topic very subjective topic and that's why we like to have the voice of what we will call reason <laughs> <laughs> and we'll have the theological view of it and tonight with us we have Father Britton, he's a resident at St. Mary's College. He also teaches at the School of Theology at the Mount of um, the Seminary, at Mount of Vianney, or no, St. John Vianney. Sorry, I hope I, I got that wrong, <laughs> St. John Vianney. He'll correct me, and you also, <laughs> and you would know his face well from um, sometimes on our morning, Sunday morning mass at Living Waters. So before I go on, I'd like to introduce you to Father Britton. Good evening, thank you Father. very much, Lorraine well, and thank Natasha. You. Thank you for having me on your program. Thank you for coming. Yes, on. yes. <laughs> so tonight we are discussing the absolutely important uh, concept of conscience. Now, conscience is something that forms an intrinsic part of one of the aspects of the Christian message we call morality. And in the Catholic tradition, morality is treated as a science and it is the science of discerning right from wrong. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, therefore, uh, we read in Numbers 1776, deep within his conscience, man discovers a law which he has not laid upon himself, but which he must obey. Its voice, ever calling him to love and to do what is good and to avoid evil, sounds in his heart at the right moment. For man has in his heart a law inscribed by God. His conscience is man's most secret core and a sanctuary. There he is alone with God, whose voice echoes in his depths. So to put this in uh, what I believe is much more accessible language, one may very simply say that conscience can be understood as our moral faculty. It is the human perception of the voice of God in the inner core of your being. This perception of God's voice imposes on us an obligation. Do this. Avoid that. The Roman Catholic tradition has long proclaimed the sanctity, the primacy, and the inviolability of our conscience. One of the greatest of the church's theologians, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, once said that should the church without knowing all the facts, impose on someone a dictate, a command that would cause him to violate his conscience, that person should prefer to perish in excommunication rather than to violate his conscience. This notion about the importance and the inviolability of conscience is also supported by one of the greatest of the English saints, 
a man who lived in the 19th century called Cardinal John Henry Newman. And this is what he said in this very beautiful quotation about what conscience is. It is a messenger from him who, both in nature and in grace, speaks to us behind the veil and teaches us and rules us by his representatives. Conscience is the aboriginal vicar of Christ. But one of the most beautiful things about the church's teaching on conscience is that it is also a message about human beings. And at the core of this message about human beings is a call to mature discipleship. The teaching on conscience is built on certain assumptions that the church makes about human beings. The church teaches us that human beings are fundamentally free. No action is moral unless it is a free action. Human beings are also responsible. The God who loves us is also the God who makes demands of us. And we are responsible and in charge of our moral actions. Thus it is that the Catholic tradition has always made a distinction between moral precepts and the law which the church proclaims and the application of these laws which is the responsibility of the individual. Isn't it wonderful to think, my dear Natasha and Lorraine, that our church thinks of us in terms of spiritual adulthood. The Lord Jesus Christ founded a church and not a kindergarten. <laughs> it is not my job as a pastor, nor neither is it, is it the job of the Archbishop or of Pope Francis to tell us <laughs> what, to, what yes. to do. In fact, uh, Richard Gula has this very, very useful, I think, observation that a key pastoral priority today is helping people to make conscience decisions in light of the church's tradition, in light of the scriptures. And this is where we get into that whole notion of the formation of conscience. But before I get into that, I just want to say that conscience in, in a very modern way is understood in three ways. Conscience is one, a basic sense of responsibility so that people who kill people in the streets, those who rape children and so on, they can be said to be without conscience. They are sociopaths. They, they have no sense of responsibility or obligation. But conscience is also the process of arriving at a mature decision with due deliberation. And part of the message about human beings is that we are fundamentally community people. A conscious decision is not made in a vacuum, but always in, to, in relation with the religious community of which we are a part, to which we belong. A good conscious decision is one over which one agonizes. You consult the Bible, your parish priest, your prayer group leader, your good friend. And of course, you resort to assiduous prayer before you can properly call it a conscious decision. And it is in this realm, in this aspect of conscience, that the church plays a key role because this process needs all the help it can get. It is in informing individuals about the values at stake, what Jesus says about certain moral acts or certain values in presenting to people moral exemplars that the church plays a role in the formation of conscience. And let me just say that conscience can be good conscience or it can be erroneous conscience. Every Roman Catholic has the responsibility to form a good conscience. 
It is not a simple case of my going off and deciding for myself what I think is right or what I think is wrong. An individualistic approach to conscience goes hand in hand with what you've been talking about, Lorraine, relativism. Relativism is simply the rejection of the position that there is no such thing as a truth that is generally valid for human beings. The relativist says in very crude terms, well, you know, you believe what you believe, and I believe what I believe. But the Roman Catholic moral tradition is always optimistic about the ability of human beings to form moral consensus around very important issues. We think, for example, about the two wars in Iraq, where a lot of the world community opposed this whole idea of uh, preemptive strikes. We think about the growing consensus against things like genital uh, mutation. Mu uh, mu yes, mutilation, mutilation of women, young women, mm -hmm. and of course, Think about the news now, the uproar over those 200 young women abducted from their parents in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. We can form moral consensuses over particular issues, and that is a tremendous insight of the Catholic tradition. We can talk, but the tragedy of relativism today is that people give up uh, on any possibility of people dialoguing and coming to moral consensus. Mm -hmm. And everyone is treated as if they live in a sealed off world uh, and they cannot communicate with anyone else. Mm -hmm. And that is a real tragedy of relativism. The final thing I'd like to say about conscience is that conscience is not only the general sense of responsibility that we must have, it is not only the process through which we arrive at a mature decision, but it is the final judgment which is the ultimate norm of all our moral actions. Mm -hmm. You and I, we have to pray that once we make our conscious, our conscience decisions, it is made out of a well-formed and good conscience. Because once that decision is arrived at, then we are under obligation to follow the dictates of our conscience. Mm -hmm. So that in a nutshell, uh, putting it somewhat uh, in a very uh, succinct Same manner, point. is basically the church's perspective on the important reality called conscience. And our when we, ability. So uh, just let me get, when you follow your conscience, when... Mm -hmm. When you for, your conscience is formed in you through that process, arrive at the decision. Yes. Then you can face the consequences of it. Precisely. With courage, because Precisely. it came from a process. And, and the thing, Natasha, is so much of us lack that courage, but conscience demands uh, a real courage from us, a yes. real mature. What I also be. saw from what you're saying, it demands from us that that thing where where the Lord in one of the gospels recently, where Jesus says, "Put out into the deep." Yes. You know, we have to put out into the deep. Precisely. Because from what you read, one of your first quotes, actually from the Catechism, 1776, mm -hmm. um, it starts with deep within the conscience, yes. right? So it's a place down inside of us. Precisely. And unless we quiet ourselves and embrace silence in this busy world, we must embrace. I'm just saying that. So it's straight through what you were saying. We have to embrace silence to get to a Absolutely. place deep within us, Absolutely. where we can even hear the voice of God. Absolutely. And, it's something done prayerfully. Yeah. And what I wanted to bring up, which is bringing it back to the um, priority, regenerating moral and spiritual values, especially now in our society in Trinidad and Tobago, what we're seeing is really a breakdown. And sometimes it, we question, was there ever formation, which I know will come back to natural law eventually. Mm -hmm. um, but we see developing in, in um, society, I'm not going to say young people, I'm going to say society, yeah. what we call the unholy trinity of money, power, pleasure. Yes. And, and that, to me, corrupts the conscience, mm -hmm. or your conscience. Yes. And, um, we have the, regener the degeneration, not yes. regen, the degeneration <laughs> of moral and yes. spiritual values, you know. Yes. And that, that puts a whole other spin on it because, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to get into anything, but we have a lot of um, different advertising, yes. huge part. Um, just do it. 
if it yes. feels good, you know, that yes. type of thing. Uh -huh. And that I think that affects us. And I think as Catholics, in terms of looking at the priority of regenerating moral and spiritual values, really have to get to where the degeneration started. started. Precisely. Mm -hmm. But I just want to say to both of you that what we experience now is a moral crisis at its heart is also a spiritual crisis. Yes. Right. You see, so that the moral breakdown today is so great that it requires great inner resources mm -hmm. to be able to do what is right and avoid what is wrong. Right. But in the church, um, I believe that for many, many years we've stressed morality and, and we've divorced it from spirituality. Correct. I want to say something else too. I think, and, and, and the more we're talking about this, mm -hmm. the real revolution, I always say Jesus is such a radical to follow mm -hmm. Jesus. They think about it. I mean, it's like this man mm -hmm. who walked upon the earth, he was born to a virgin, who still is a virgin. That's yes. radical. Yes. That's radical. But we mm -hmm. have got so into the habit of it yes. that we don't realize that really and truly, if we follow what the church is leading us to is the more radical revolutionary position than Amen. just saying, I feel to do this. That's the easier way. Yes. But these relativists feel they're being revolutionary, yes. but they're not because Precisely. they're not being revolutionary. The real revolution is following Jesus. It's difficult. It makes no sense. <laughs> you know, it's just a leap of faith. It's a mystery. Who yeah. is this man who come down from here, born in a trough, <laughs> you know, run to here, run away Absolutely. from Caesar? Come, I mean, who? And how come he lives today and we following him still? And that's the revolution. Absolutely. What we have is a corruption of our freedom. Yes. Yes. You know, and, and the freedom that approach like that becomes license and you become cut off from the community, cut off from God, cut off from nature. Yes. And you know, when you talked about um, the third dimension of conscience being that community aspect, I thought of a monk or not a monk per se, I shouldn't say that, say a hermit. Yes. But non religious, mm -hmm. you know, just living, living by himself up on a mountain top. How does conscience, how is conscience in terms of that community aspect, how is it formed in him? And I'm thinking that all creation is one. Really, yes. truly, we are one and just yes. part of the one being uh -huh. God, the almighty creator of heaven and earth and everything yes. in it. So that his actions, like the flap of a butterfly's mm -hmm. wings can cause an earthquake somewhere. His actions, his decisions, even though seemingly not affecting anyone, affects yes. everyone. Precisely, you know? so even so that there's even community with nature, yes. and even we we human beings who live in community must always make our uh, moral decisions also with nature in mind. Eh? Okay. Correct. You know, in the Synod priority, I think it was in the mission statement, one of the, the, the more umbrella statements talks about reconciliation to self, God, creation. Absolutely. And it, it talks about that. Absolutely. It calls it back, so it's dead on spot. We're going to go to um, a family now. We have a little long clip. Don't worry. A um, long because it's a, it's a big family <laughs> and each of them speaks, right? So that um, they're going to take us through what an average Catholic family, it's a big family, so it's a Catholic family. <laughs> What that big Catholic family thinks about relativism. So let's just sit back and listen to them carefully and we'll come back and discuss it. I urge you to get your phones ready and we will um, show you the number to call. Call in and take advantage of Father Britton while he's take here, advantage. okay? <laughs> okay, so let's Cautiously. get our clip. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a statement being used a lot now over the last few years. Um, and it's surprising the people using it. But it's, um, this thing about um, everything is relative, there's no absolute truth. It, it, I mean, it's like the most absurd statement one could make. I mean, of course, many things are relative, but not everything is relative. As, as, as I heard a speaker say once, the next time some, you hear somebody say that, that everything is relative and there's no absolute truth. Ask me if he's absolutely sure. The, um, so, the, the, that, that concept is absurd. And I mean, if anybody thinks about it, that there's no absolute truth, what we will have on our hands is chaos. Because it means there's absolutely no right or no wrong anymore. Everything that the church stands for and the principles it gives you are, are all open to discussion. So there's no, no right, no wrong. 
no discussion necessary because your right is not my right and my right is not your right. And of course, they bring good argument because they say it has to do, of course, with your culture, with how you were brought up, with the environment, with a, with a whole heap of things. So, of course, many things are relative, but not everything. And in a more um, practical way, in our home, um, after I'd gone to a pilgrimage to Britannia, I felt strongly that we had to say the rosary every day, or at least as often as we could. But, wow, that met with such objection and sighs and, oh gosh, another prayer, not a rosary, it's so boring, it's so monotonous, it's so repetitive, it's so a lot. However, that conviction that I had, which I think really was from God, um, enabled, gave me the strength to say, we are saying the rosary, let's start. Come on, come on. I mean, they could, you know, eventually they grew, but I mean, and I'm sure they can tell you stories of which I grew, <laughs> but they grew to a place where if anything happens, to them or their friends and say, let's say the rosary. Let's say the rosary, you know. I think they appreciate it because of the praying the rosary constantly, trying to pray it every afternoon. Even though I may fall asleep many times during the rosary and they may all strip and get up because, oh God, mommy's sleeping again. But at least the desire was there, the intention was there and sometimes we completed it wonderfully and sometimes we didn't. But, um, I think that's, that's one thing that I felt absolute <laughs> truth about and that I think that we were able to give our children so that, you know, they have, a, they have that sort of um, base on Our Lady. Right, you all agree? In terms of relativism, for my own self, I think the way society has changed a lot over the few years, it has brought a lot of things to my own attention and maybe made me question a lot of things in terms of my own faith and in terms of what I think to be the truth and in that struggle where I was in a battle trying to figure out you know myself and what I really stand for and what I believe in in terms of my faith and all of these things what helped me to realize that you know those traditional values that my parents taught me and that the church teaches are the truth is even just looking around right now at what is going on in society and I inter every day I interact with a lot of children because I'm a teacher and seeing the way that these children it's, it's just completely different when I was growing up which is not even that long ago because I'm only 26 years old to the way that children are these days it's so different and the way that the they have a lot less respect for older people. The way that they just want this give me now, I must get this now, and you know, this give me, give me kind of attitude in the society that we're growing up in, where you just get whatever you want right away, you know? And just seeing those children every day and the different struggles that they, have, they go through that I didn't even have to go through not so long ago, it just shows me or brings light to my eyes that, you know, what I did learn from my parents is the truth. And those rules or those traditions need to stick because once you take those traditions away is when you have a breakdown in society. And, you know, um, I think that that has taught me that, you know, there is room for change, yes, but um, that the whole issue with relativism and so I think is um, a bit, um, I don't know what the correct word is, but hmm? yeah, a bit, yeah, it's not really as great as everybody, you know, is making it out to be, you know. Well, what my friend Shia tell me is like, how you eating so healthy, I eat a little junk sometimes and then, you know, um, and well, I know my friends, they sin, and I see that, but I don't judge them, and I just acknowledge it, and I try to tell them, do that, and, you know, I, well, I, 
as a Christian try to follow the way the word of God and yet how I cope with um not like living my own life is I do follow everything that God has taught me or or any anybody who's holy or you know or I just try to take their information and turn it into my own and understand it and appreciate it. Um, for me, God uses many, many avenues to speak to me through my family, through my siblings, and I'm very fortunate to have a praying family, people who are close to God that I trust. So when they come to me, I listen. Because for other people, somebody else coming to you, you might receive that as Somebody trying to give you advice you don't want to hear, somebody thinks they're better than you, whatnot. But when you have that trust that you trust somebody, you trust what they're saying, you're going to believe it and accept it or receive it. Even if you don't take it in entirety, you're going to take that and pray about it and take what you believe from that. So from people coming to me and my family and having God sent messages, which I believe, or like my sister, she has dreams, God has given her that gift. and. It's a beautiful, truthful gift. So when she says, I drum this, I believe a lot of what she says. Also, because I have a personal relationship with God, I, um, I ask for his guidance all the time. I ask for the Holy Spirit to guide me, to be with me. And I feel that I've developed that relationship with God where I could hear his voice, I could understand his word, I could know when he's directing me. When, you know, when you have that... Uh, when you're spiritually attuned then and you can, it, it might be in words, it might mean a direct loud voice, but like they show in the movies, but you know in your heart how you're being directed, you know, you can even pick up vibes about a situation or people. Okay, I'm getting a very strong negative vibe about a situation, I really don't think I should go to this party, I really don't think I should get into this vehicle. And, and often it's revealed that that was a very good word, you know, if something might happen after. And also, um, because of how I've been exposed, I know of the Blessed Sacrament, and God really does speak to you in, in the silence. Because it's such a busy world and tied into the relevant, relativism, whatever. Um, yeah, um, it, you really, it's difficult to get quiet time. Unless you're waking up four o'clock when the cock crows, which I don't. Um, you know, it's difficult even in your own house to get a quiet five minutes, especially in our house where everybody's knocking on everybody's door. It's constant, you know. So the Blessed Sacrament is a good place to escape, and I would encourage any young person, anybody of any age, gender, culture, because I've brought people who weren't Catholic to the Blessed Sacrament, and they always appreciated it. They said, wait, I brought, you know, the, I grew up with the fellas from the block, that kind of thing, you know, who living all kind of lives, you know, and not excited or interested in changing it anyway. And one way or another, I got them to come to Blessed Sacrament and they asked to come back. So that means without even fully understanding what it is and what, the, you know, the physical presence of Jesus being in this little host, they are able to receive that grace and that blessing. And in there, you know, I think it was Jody or Mommy, but you know, through their words and through my own experience, you really... Like you think of it like the undo of knots where you have you have a mess in your heart, in your mind, and you don't, what am I supposed to do with this? And you just go to God and say, take it. And somehow or another, peace and just things just start to reveal. And you know, that's the way God speaks to me. And also through um, Christian books or the Bible, I pray and I hope, ask God to send me a message today. And often it's very direct. You know, people would ask me certain stuff because one weekend I'm partying every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, then next weekend I'm doing charity work. <laughs> so, you know, even my friends, people I encounter, they're like, okay, you know, like are you two people, like one weekend we know you as this, next weekend this, and it's like, you know, I can't identify myself as one person, but, and it is a lot of spirits with the alcohol, over drinking, over partying, and stuff like that. but. I do believe it could be done in moderation and you have to have your spirit at peace to be able to do that because certain times in my life I have been overdoing it and then I just stop and I just realize oh my god I'm not happy I'm like what am I doing with my life anything like that and you just have to pray about it really and 
like you know so I started going to church well I always go like once a week but for me church wasn't so interesting like I'd more prefer mass during the week which is just half an hour and then after you know meditate by myself pray use the bible and for me it's not going to church as much I would say you know people just say oh you're catholic you go to church just assume that you know but you're sinning as well but it's more helping other people and from the first time I tried doing missionary work and helping people that way I realized oh my god this is how I feel closest to God closer than being in church just praying the rosary anything this is you know like just a place that I feel that I'm close to God and I've seen it with other people that do it as well and when you have other people I think is when you just look at the person even if something is hard like you're changing a diaper or anything like that and you just think in your head oh my gosh what am I doing you just feel to throw up like you just <laughs> think in your head you know this is like this is Jesus and like what Jesus said before I'm not sure exactly what it was but something like when I was hungry you gave me to eat when I was thirsty you gave me to drink and it's true like anything you do unto other people you do to him and for me helping other people is definitely the way I've been closest to God and it's just my journey and so I encourage anybody out there like if you want to join any like help out at orphanages missions anywhere it's really a good thing to do it's helped me a lot you know I just want to thank the Gonzales family and for their free-spirited sharing and what I love about this family is how real they are and just to give a little synopsis before I ask Father Britton to, to speak to it um, they spoke about struggles they spoke about overdoing it but what to me stood out is they spoke about really a strong solid family base a good formation traditional values that even when they felt they came off track or off path they had something to fall back on that brought them back on path and I think that's important we don't do it right all the time at the end of the day Adam ate the apple Absolutely. and we <laughs> fell from grace and and I think that's what it's about you know yes Father Britton well I, I loved how you mentioned um, I, and I just want to take up on your last word grace yeah simply because I, I was looking at the clip and I, and I was thinking you know human life is really grace filled mm -hmm. um, I, I just want to begin because one of the words that jumped out of me uh, uh, was when their first daughter spoke and you had a sense that young people today live in a very changing, a fast-changing world. And therefore, that must be very disorienting and, and would really rob them of any sense of any solid foundation of truth. But again, in their sharings and in their journeys, I saw them referring again to common sense. And they all open to intuition. All of these yes. are very traditional Cut values. Yes. So she talked about his sister's dreams and that kind of thing. There was mm -hmm. one there sharing. And then, of course, they're all open to prayer. Mm -hmm. So that I saw these kids using and being really open to all of their human capacities and not simply narrowing down their their perception or seeing truth through the glasses of their education or something but they were using their prayer life their intuition their common sense mm -hmm. and of course their life experience human life is full of grace and and i think um in spite of our sinfulness somehow god managed manages to touch us and and really yes. we we find our way towards truth true there was something that that um I think the father had said it earlier on. He said, um, it'll just be chaos. He said, if, um, if everybody, you know, yes. <laughs> it'll just be chaos. And I thought of that quote. I mean, my literature um, teachers would be quite proud of me now. <laughs> It generally is in the head. It's um, things fall apart from Chinwea China. Right, it yes. says things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere yes. anarchy is loosed upon the world. Yes. And I thought of that when he said about... Um, It'll be chaos, yeah. you know. If everybody Pretty does good. what they want to do, we will have what's happening in society now. Precisely. You know, just what you alluded to when you were um, yeah. giving us your first teaching. Everybody cannot do what Precisely. they want to do because we are community-based. But we manage, in spite of it all, to form important moral consensus it's around very important issues like war True. and and treatment mm -hmm. of women and all of that. Yes. So, so I, I really, really want to affirm my own. 
I, I proclaim my own belief that God is still in the world. <laughs> and that was great news. And that's excellent and news. exactly <laughs> what um, my other point was in my head, that uh, um, when Jesus left us, he said, I'm going to send you an advocate. Yes. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit who that's will right. lead you into all Don't truth. You? You know, Amen. and I remember the spiritual director, I should say spiritual director of our family. We rely on her a lot. Um, she says to say that, oh, Holy Spirit, pray as often as you can during the day, you know, mm -hmm. so the Holy yes. Spirit can guide you every move. Amen. And, and what it speaks to again is what Father alluded to early on, is this mature discipleship, which we saw coming out in the family, yes. you know. It, and I like that term, by the way. <laughs> you know, I like the kindergarten. Yes. <laughs> you came to found a church, not a kindergarten, kindergarten, but it looks like everybody just files in for babysitting. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true because we are free. You know, we spoke about that freedom of choice that we have. Yes. But we have to be mature and we have to be responsible at Amen. the end of the day. Well, we yeah. have one other family. Um, it's the Cooper family. We met them last time and we're going to meet them again. Um, they have a big family too. So yes. another good Catholic family. <laughs> <laughs> They're from Santa Cruz. And they also help us to tease out the topic of relativism. So let's see what they say. In a nutshell, um, it might be saying what I believe to be true is true and what you believe to be true is your truth. Yeah. So in other words, we have two different truths. I believe this, therefore it is so. She believes this, Lisa believes this, and therefore it is so. That's real. To me, that's what relativism is. So therefore, the, the issue is really um, as, a, as a Catholic, to remain true to the truth. The truth can only be one person, <laughs> the way, the truth, and the light, right? Light. So, so therefore, we have to be very clear as Catholics where our truth is. Once we start to move away from that, that's when we get into the sin. One of the things we also teach the children is to love the sinner and hate the sin. And the whole question about relativism, I mean, the way I explained it to them very simply, is that, you know, I lie, you know, I tell little white lies, but you see the boy next door, he tells really big lies, so I'm okay. All right? So the thing about it is the sin is absolute. But God in his mercy, you know, he is the ultimate judge. And we are sometimes saying, well, you know, that is wrong, and that person should not have done that. And I mean, we don't want to be crossing any lines here, but we really do not know. And what we try to maintain is to stay on the right path. You will fall because as human beings, we are subject to the first sin of Adam and Eve, so we will fall. What you do as you know what you do after that really is what um, affects your life and the lives of other the lives of others. Well, if someone hurt my family or committed a crime against my family, of course my first instinct like any other person I'm normal and you're not perfect, I would probably be angry with the person or upset because you know, my family is really, really close to me and anyone who hurts them, I would usually or normally just get upset with the person. But then I always like, you know, sit down and reflect with myself. And then, you know, I think, you know, what would Jesus do? What, would, what did he do when he was crucified on that cross? He forgave everyone. So I would think that I would forgive them. So we met the Cooper family and quite an interesting family and you know what, what I'd like to point out is that they all homeschool so they come with a completely different perspective from the tradition, other traditional, what we would call traditional families in this instance. Um, and they, they do have different ways of working out their, 
their struggles. But again, what we saw coming back is that they go back to that traditional value, that traditional base that was taught at, from the home, from core values from through their parents, you know. Father Britton, you have anything you want to say? Uh, uh, no, I, I will just touch by, you know, there's something that, that um, you know, when we talked about that, that truth, that single truth that cannot be denied, remember that the church also affirms the absolute unity of the human race. Yes, we are not different true. races. We are one, one race. Yes, one body. Of one body. Precisely. Oh, and Father, before we go on, we have a caller. Good evening. Good evening, caller. Um, um, hello. hello. Good evening. Good How evening. Are you? You're on. Um, I was listening to. I am listening to your show, and you mentioned the Holy Spirit prayer. Now I went to confession, and Father said, "Say the Holy Spirit prayer," and I said a prayer to the Holy Spirit. But I want to know if the if that is the same prayer that we should all be praying to the Holy Spirit. Well, the one I talked about is, O oh, Holy Spirit, soul of my soul, I adore thee, enlighten, guide, strengthen, and console me. me. Tell me what I ought to do. Command me to do it. I promise to be submissive. Only show me what I ought to do. I know that. Command me to do it. Something's wrong. Right? <laughs> 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 Something's wrong. Yeah. 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 Listen to me. With God, you Thank see, you. once you turn, there's a passage yes. of scripture that says, once you turn towards him, he like he there waiting for you. God just turns to towards turn. you. Exactly. Yes. As you only say, eh, He's, he's there waiting. So if, you, uh, if you only say, oh, Holy Spirit, come, I sure that's enough. Yeah. Am I right? That's right. <laughs> well, shoot, I passed that test. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Welcome. No problem. Thank you for calling. Bye-bye. Um, I, I teach a post-communion class in my parish, and what I told them, you know, I was so emotional when I told them that because that was the whole thing with this whole social media and how everything is instantaneous. Mm -hmm. it, it reminds me of what we were saying here about conscience and formation and development of conscience as a journey. Mm -hmm. But I told them I'm so sorry for them in a way that they don't have the room to make a mistake. I say to them, I say, the pressure is on you all. I'm sorry about yes. that. There's nothing I can do. I say, I'm sorry. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. they don't have a chance to make a mistake as you press send. That's it. it. Your life has changed forever. It's gone viral, right. full stop. I say, sorry, you're under so much pressure, but that's just the reality you have to face, which I didn't have to face. I mean, and I got into it, we're not that old. I wouldn't give my age, but, you know, <laughs> I'm not 26. But <laughs> we but, used you know, to say the word ago. once it is said, it cannot be unsaid. Correct. Well, the picture once it is posted cannot be taken, be taken back. back. Yeah. And the instant that is posted, it's at it. least, at least... A thousand people see it yes. one time. One time in that instant, uh, or when you press That's send, frightening, even isn't it? In, yes, it is. It is. It's frightening. It's, it's frightening. You don't have room to make a mistake in yes. your own journey. You That's know. That's right. Should and God is so merciful. You know, we just did Divine Mercy Sunday. We just celebrated yeah. that. Yes. A fathom of mercy waiting for us, but the world is there to say, "Hey, ha, catch you." You know. That's that's yes. tough. That's tough for the young people. Tough for all of us. T tough yeah. for all of us. us. We can't make a mistake. Um, what else? Well, again, in our journey of um, exploring conscience, I think it's important to um, know and to really understand that conscience is based on fact. And before I go on, I, I don't want to keep the callers waiting. So good evening, caller. Hi, evening. Good afternoon. Afternoon. I just want to share that um, with what the last clip said. Um, the girl, that how she would forgive the people, I really would respect that because I know how hard it is to forgive someone that will do something, like, to hurt your family or, you know. So, like, I just want to share that point. Thank you, Thank Jordan. Lammy Ramsden, I recognize your voice. <laughs> <laughs> As my big girl, and you know, I thank you for sharing with us, Jody. Yes. Um, Jody is 14 years old, she'll be 15 in three months, and I can't believe the pressure she's under, you know. Mm -hmm. But so far, so good. Just keep sticking all those young people out there, just turn to God, and He'll just do the rest, you mm -hmm. know. Just keep in your family tradition, keep listening, mm -hmm. keep trying. I guess that's all we could do. That's all we could do. And you know, it came out very strongly in the Gonzales family. Yeah. Yes. That yes. it is a struggle. Yes. Nobody's not, it's not a walk in the park. No. And we acknowledge that. And it's a good to acknowledge and embrace it. Because only until you do that would you really recognize that um, 
you, you, you have to work at it. It's yes. not easy. You have to rely on God. God wants us to rely on Him, and He will help us, you know? So um, This formation of conscience thing is not easy, but it is a journey that we cannot give up. Or Correct. else, you know, if you project, like how they morph people 15 years. <laughs> That's right. When you morph the, the, the generation on Trinidad and Tobago 15 years from now, it's but frightening. But there are just so many resources available for young people today. There are Catholic sites, uh, right. you know, all over the internet. There are all, all the churches' teachings are posted online. There's Correct. a Catechism of the Catholic Church. There's Trinity Television. Right? Yes. yes. So, <laughs> true, true. All these are aids to forming a proper conscience. Yes, true. Yes, yes, yes. I would like to see the church do more in Catholics schools, Catholic yeah. secondary schools, you yeah. know, I would like um, something, a guide, a physical yes. guide they could follow to say do X, Y, Z, like a syllabus, yes. you know, or, or, or I even would like, like tracks or something, you know, yes. I, I do believe yes. in the free CDs, of tracks, you know, yes. things to form their conscience because they're like sponges at this point. Correct. Then and you have a call there. Yeah, yes. we do, we do, Father. Um, good evening. Hello. Hello. Yeah, we do, we do, Father. Hi, you're on, you're on Hello, here. good afternoon. Good Hello. afternoon. Good afternoon. Am I? Yes, you, we're hearing you. Am I on? Yes, yes. you are. Hi. Um, I just want to... Am I on? I just want to say um, a simple thing, really, about exploring conscience and a formation of the conscience of the young child. I read in a book the other day. Um, it's about teaching the child the social graces, which really brings grace to us. And we have it when we go through the sacraments where we have the grace. That's all. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. I like that point about sticking closely to sacraments. So, yeah. so many people use sacraments as, um, I would say, a gas station. Worse than they use the Sunday Mass, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, my child is seven. Time for them to do First Communion. Then they do First Communion. They stay away from the church. Oh, my child is 13. Time to come back for co um, confirmation. Right. They do confirmation and stay away from the church. Something Amen. they tick off. Yes, yeah. something they tick off. Some people actually wait until they get, they want to get married and recognize, wait a minute, I should have made First <laughs> Communion. I should have did con do confirmation. And they yeah. Go and do a quick, true. a quickie, true. True. and they come back and, you know, yes. and it's important that you understand that it's a process. Yes. It's a journey. Being Catholic or being Christian is not about going to church every Sunday. It's hard work, eh? It's hard work. It is. Yes, hard work. And, and, and I think what you have to realize, it's a daily walk. Yes. But it's a labor of love. Yeah. If, just like one of the girls from the Gonzales, if you know Jesus, she says, I have a personal relationship with Correct. God. You know, I found that was such a powerful statement, so easily yes. said. Yeah. But you could tell it was from truth. You know, if you have a personal relationship and love him like that, it's a labor of love. Mm -hmm. It's a labor of love. It's not, love is not easy, and it's not different with loving God, you know? It's something we have to do, and yes. we do it because we love Him. Yes. Correct. So, Father, before we, I close the show, is there anything you'd like to leave the, um, our view in public with? Uh, no, I, I, just, I just want to say that um, really and truly, conscience is, is built on a message about human beings. We are free, we are responsible, we are made in the image and likeness of God. And we are also grace-filled. It means, therefore, that human beings have been created in a sense, I would rather say that we are created open to grace. Yes, we yeah. are. And all of us, eh? God, God extends his hands to the whole human race and somehow God is still in the world. He's finding us yes. we don't find him but true. god is finding us and, and we are finding our way to the truth true. with and god's that, help yeah and that note of hope um i just want to remind i want to thank our viewers thank father brayton for being thank here with us to explore much. this very detailed and Deep difficult topic. topic and um to remind our viewers that it is a journey it is a walk it is a labor of love and remember we are mature discipleship and that we are, Father said something that I read, he founded a church, not a kindergarten. And I think that's important to remember, to really go back to your traditional values, work at it, and Amen. pray about it. Develop your personal relationship with God. Thank you. God bless. God bless.